Welcome to the fourth session, Community Curations for TEDx for Capital 2020. Our theme this year is Light Bearer. Um, I have with me Donald Okudu, who is the primary licensee for TEDx for Harcourt. And I also have a special guest today, Florence Kayemba. Um, she's a journalist, she's a development communication specialist, a researcher on security issues. Her primary interests are in preventing and countering violent extremism, terrorism, mass atrocities prevention. and prevention, mass atrocities prevention, and very importantly, security sector reforms in sub-Saharan Africa and in the Middle East. Before we jump into today's topic, which we have titled Monopoly of Violence, I would have Donald Okudu tell us more about the theme for this year's event, Light Bearer. The theme for the year, Light Bearer, basically deals with how, as human beings, we manage our expectations between hope and despair. But also, we also wanted to explore the role of a light bearer. And in this instance, we'll be looking at the light bearer from the perspective of a lighthouse. A lighthouse as um, a symbol and also a guide to um, oncoming ships to minimize the, um, what's the word? Uh, potential um, collision as a common shore. So a lighthouse in this perspective is the one that guides them and has foresight because of experience over time. So today our conversation is going to be based primarily on how much of violence have we seen over a long period of time and um, what brings about it and how do we um, how do we help to make sense of it and control violence as a, before it gets worse? Um, so in that regard, we're going to be discussing it from that point. But also, we, um, it's also interesting to also look at the community curation from the perspective of um, pre-event conversation that we'll be having before the day of the event, just so that we can build more context around the theme for the year. So part of the conversations for today would also help us make more sense as we begin to um, have future discussion on the 5th of December where um, the TEDx event will be happening. So we can make a lot more sense from all that has happened from the um, NSAS protest to the looting and other um, issues of violence that are very peculiar, especially in the Niger Delta region. Yep. Today's topic, um, monopoly, of violence. I think the theme generally out there is monopoly on violence. We've had um, talks on um, two sessions ago. We talked about farming and food security, which brought to light the pending food scarcity that we may have in the country. Last week, we talked about poverty, poverty spectrum, and illiteracy and education and the need for education. Monopoly of violence. It's, it's, it's almost a dark subject. It is a dark it's subject. A dark it's yes, not because, almost a dark subject. Yes. It is a dark subject. Violence is dark. Okay? It doesn't matter <laughs> who is perpetrating that violence, whether it's the state or otherwise, mm -hmm. it is a dark subject. Yes. But like, I would like to say the state has the legitimate mm -hmm. um, monopoly on the use of force. How much force is excessive yes. force is brought to question? the legitimacy is sure but the monopoly is what has been questioned by these little uprisings here and there if people are saying if you who is the custodian who is meant to uphold the law is is pushing your mm -hmm. your legitimate use to this extent mm -hmm. that's what we have different groups that are i mean uprising well well, um, well, I'm going to start with the NSARS protest, okay. which was very, very genuine. These are very genuine demands. And I really believe that um, if issues of police brutality had been handled before, as they came to the fore, we wouldn't be where we are today. We kept getting promises from the government that it is going to be addressed. 
uh, reform SARS, reform the police. It just kept going on and on, but the situation never really changed, you know. So we have a situation where I'm sure the government did not see this coming, and which is also a failure of intelligence. The fact that you did not see this coming, the fact that you could not even anticipate that it would take on this form, you know, is, is a failure of intelligence. Because you should have, at least, you should be able to foresee some of these things. You may not have the whole picture, but realize that over a period of time, and unfortunately, in a country such as this one, you know, and it's, it's not very unique to Nigeria, but any other African country, where you've got an uprising, a mass uprising, there are people who will take advantage of it. You know, so this is a country that has quite a significant number of non-state armed groups. You can call them whatever you want. Okay. You know, they come a dime and a dozen. So here you are, you've got this mass uprising. You know, the state is focused on that. And when I say the state, I do not necessarily mean river state. I mean it, you know, broadly. And they're focused on that. So at the end of the day, you have other people who have now been awakened and said, hold on. I remember I had this problem and nobody paid attention. You know, so you find groups of people are coming out and using whatever method they can to try to gain attention. Why? Because historically, we've always, unfortunately, it always seemed as if violence actually pays. Because what happens, those who perpetrate violence end up involved in all types of programs. And that's why when we talk about disarmament, demobilization, you know, reintegration, it must be done in parallel, you know, with transitional justice providing reparations for victims, retributive justice, punishing those who perpetrated violence in whatever way possible, you know. But at the end of the day, none of this has really happened. And that is why you see that, you know, people have a lot of grievances that have le been left unaddressed for such a long time. And you see each, each region has its own set of grievances. You know, yeah. the Niger Delta, we all know what our issues are, <laughs> okay, that have lingered for so long. I mean, we protested for so long, you know, and I sort of feel like the only time the government has tried to pay attention to us is when, you know, the pipeline started being blown up. But did we have to go to that degree to gain attention, you know? Um, and this varies from region to region. But at the end of the day, the way the government is responding to this is only creating a wider gap between the state and its citizenry. For like. this country to move forward, you need to have both working together. But unfortunately, the social contract we've been trying to forge for so long is totally broken. It is totally broken. How is a state going to ensure that it can restore trust in its institutions? Because I know that state judicial panels have been set up, you know, where victims can now talk about, you know, the experiences, experiences. you know, uh, with police brutality. But at the end of the day, it's not enough to set up those panels if you are not reforming institutions. Mm. And what does reform even mean? Who is defining reform? You know, how are citizens participating in the reform process? You know, because we say we are a democracy, but a democracy is not about having elections. Being a democracy is about being inclusive, having voices, listening to their concerns, you know. I think for me, the country has come to a point, I mean, we had a national conference, I think in 2014, and now they're, you know, they're clamors for national, you know, restructuring. But at the end of the day, without a platform for national dialogue and reconciliation, these issues are still gonna serve. And we have a huge youth population you cannot ignore. We don't even know how many weapons are within society. You have a disarmament exercise every now and then, but. What is driving this proliferation? How are we dealing with these things? Does the state have monopoly of violence anymore? Of course not. With the burgeoning of all these non-state armed groups, of course it doesn't have that monopoly. So therefore, it is time to sit on the table and ask some very critical questions. Where do we go from here? People talk about transitional justice, but I'm asking, are we a society in transition? Because if you are in transition, where are you coming from? Okay, we right. might understand where we're coming from, but where are we going? Right. What efforts have been made in nation building? You know, so I think for me, building social cohesion right from the grassroots, you know, when I say grassroots, I mean communities, yeah. and social cohesion is about pe people having 
like a sense of belonging in that community and being able to have relationships within that community as well. It is so, so important. And I believe for me, social cohesion is one of the foundations of peace. But that can happen when our societies have been fractured, they've been traumatized. You know, we've had violent conflict, pockets of it, for a long time. In the Northeast, in the Niger Delta, they just all keep mutating. So frankly speaking, using kinetic methods to address this conflict is no longer working. You have to think about the nine kinetic. How do we come to the table and start talking? But going out, guns are blazing, you know, killing innocent people or arresting innocent people is just going to worsen the problem. Who is coming to the table? We've had people come to the table before. We've had um, our government, I uh, guess, well, you know what? It's, it's not, terrorists. It's not for me who to decide. To of course, the people who are coming to the table. Who is not coming to the table? Well, the people <laughs> coming to the table are people who should represent the interests of communities of diverse groups. So whether they're women, whether they're youth, whether they're persons with disability, you know, but it should be representative of the different regions. And we all know that reform, that change is a process. And we all need to define what that change is. And that will differ. You know what I mean? These reforms and these changes are processes that would come when, if there is the, the, I mean, the process of transitional justice, when that starts in danger. Not really. It's not that automatic. Well, it's oh, it's yes. not automatic because when you're talking about changes and processes, of course, there are other things that need to happen alongside that. Yes. When I talk about change, you may talk about policy, you may talk about reforms. That is different. I'm you know, that is different like from down the, line. the transitional justice. No, okay. that's, that needs to start happening now. Okay. What people forget that a lot of these things are not linear. They're not necessarily sequential. That sometimes they need to happen in power. And how you manage that, for example, when you talk about transitional justice, you've got two areas. You've got retributive, you've got restorative, right? And so restorative, you're basically looking at issues like reparation, compensation for victims. The they could be victims of police brutality, but the only yeah. way that can happen is when people actually admit that they have done wrong, even if it is a state. Because transitional justice without also the state being held to account for whatever human rights violations have been committed is not transitional justice. You can't be the judge and the jury. It mm -hmm. cannot happen. You know. So at the end of the day, transitional justice, there is a retributive element, which is the one I think that has gotten people extremely angry that people who have committed crimes, whether they're police, whether they're parts or whether they're part of the army or whether they're part of terrorist groups or cult groups, they have not been tried. You know, they have not been punished, you know, and that in itself causes anger. For some, it even causes trauma. And what does that do? Sometimes when trauma is unresolved, when it is unaddressed, you know, person may have the propensity to commit violent acts. They may, I'm not saying it happens all the time. No, it doesn't. You know what I mean? It doesn't, oh, but then for those who have been victims of terrorism, if you read some of the stories, some of them will tell you that they ended up joining these groups because they felt that this was the only way they could survive. They could express themselves. And because they were facing um, human rights violations from the state and they felt, well, we need to protect ourselves. I might as well join, you know, uh, join this group, even if earlier on they had, you know, killed my people. So it's, it's a lot of things, you know, it's not that um, clear cut. So with transitional justice, there's also institutional reform. So it's not enough for us to have, like as I mentioned, state judicial panels, and then at the end of the day, there's no reform in the institution. When we talk about police brutality, it's not just about ending SARS. Police brutality, unfortunately, almost appeared as if, and I'm using these words carefully, as a culture within the security sector. That's the truth. So when you talk about security sector reform, it's not necessarily about training people, it is transforming a culture. And this is a problem, because even if you end SARS, does it mean that you're ending police brutality? I know this sounds controversial, but they're not the only people. You know, so in itself, the institution needs to be reformed. The entire security sector needs to be reformed. For example, how do we ensure security at the community level? Okay. You know, where, where, where is that happening? You talk about community policing. What are the tenets of community policing? What about at the state level? Is it still uh, feasible to have a national security architecture that is not taken to cognizance that there are vigilantes? You know, there are private non-state actors. You know, because like it or not, our security forces are overstretched. 
If you go to the River Ride communities within the Niger Delta, that's another story. People are mm. providing their own security, and we all know what that means. You know. So I think for me, it is time that we think about that in that aspect, but it's also time for the government to think very fundamentally about human security. The excessive use of force in solving minor issues, as, as I mean, issues as small as traffic offense. Okay, that's what I said. That's what I said in 2018. <laughs> Yes, it's, yes. It's, it's something that, it's that still again. is yeah. right now. It's a little less thing. There's something interesting that you said. When we're talking about reforms, it's not just reforming, um, ending SADs. Mm -hmm. They're police officers. They're not going to get fired. They're going to mm -hmm. get back in the police force. You, you pull it to something really, really important, which is our culture. So down not our here, culture, not our culture. Which but the culture, the culture of the institution. The culture of the institution. That when you allow things to fester for so long, okay. they become institutionalized and therefore become a part of culture. Just like corruption is so institutions culture. has become a culture. Because it goes unaddressed, it goes unpunished. So it becomes a bit of a culture. Yes. In that institution, that culture of brutality is them amongst themselves. Is that it? No, it's something that, um, quote, unquote, looks like it has been officially accepted. And once it is culture, it means it is something that is practiced among people. And it is probably accepted, whether overtly or covertly. So speaking of reforms, we've seen videos recently of, uh, of, of I don't know who they are. You know, I'd like to take you back okay. to when you talked about use the use of force. Excessive use. Excessive use of force and how it's desensitizing people to violence. Um, obviously, we know that in recent times, Obigo LGA, you know, there's been some things going on there, you know, and I yeah. cannot imagine what people have gone through in that area. You know, I remember the first days, you saw a lot of things on Twitter, you know, people were talking about the gunshots and, you know, it's very difficult because ordinarily people wouldn't know who's shooting who. You know, sometimes it's gunfire exchange, who's involved? You know, because as, as a citizen, you feel very, very vulnerable. You know, again, it is that use of force, you know, but we don't know exactly what was going on, you know, and I'm one of those who believes that those who were involved in perpetrating violence, you know, whatever group that they, they might be, state, they, state. they need to be, I'm talking about non-state, yeah, okay. that they should have been arrested no, and probably tried in court, you know. And um, I don't know, because I know uh, there are people who are calling into an independent, calling an independent investigation into this, uh, which I think would also be important. Because sometimes it's if we let tough. things fester, uh, we don't know how it's going to be like, you know? And we know that media was not really given access to that place. So mm -hmm. um, I know the state governor has come out with a statement on this, you know, and, um, but, Whatever it was, you know, it really traumatized the people who were there. Yeah. Okay, where I was going with the culture thing is yes. like you, you tried to explain in that institution. Yeah. I had a conversation once with someone about training. I was I was mm -hmm. I was talking about the training they're doing and they're showing them doing physical exercises. I was saying, is the training still how to shoot or how to be physically? We're talking of training their minds. We. I mean, letting them understand. I've seen training videos. I had this heated conversation with somebody who thought it was okay where these guys are being trained. And then I know it's like the US Marine. We, 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 we've never ever questioned, people. we've never questioned their fitness. <laughs> In a, like, if, if you get what I mean. Last, last, <laughs> last episode, we talked about um, that, that situation, that condition that they put them through during their training. And we called it conditioning. Where somebody said, "Must must that be the must we must we condition them to that level, level where?" Up. I mean, so they just come up and become beasts, and then when they see we who uh, they say we are called police. Okay, so I the never training been, supposed to demonize them. Yeah. To de my that's what I was going with this. Yeah, but to I think demonize them to that point yeah. where there's the no brutality, empathy. Where there's no brutality. I'm just thinking this is the only way they know to deal with us. That, that's actually a very interesting point, you know. I mean, I think the training has to be balanced, that there has to be, um, 
there has to be a realization that you're not going to just stay in a camp and then you're not always going to be a war zone, right? That sometimes you're going to be in communities, that sometimes people are going to get up, they're going to march, they're going to protest. How do you deal with that? You know, um, but I think for me, you raise a very, very important point. I've never been to a training camp, um, but I do know that it is important that there is some type of culture where human rights are respected, you know, and sometimes that can be very difficult, especially when you're dealing with terrorists. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean, sometimes, I mean, there is a fine line. Let's be honest here. Yeah. And sometimes also when you're a victim of brutality, you know, whether it's committed by not state armed actor or state actor, you still feel like there should be something, there should be some kind of punishment. You know what I mean? And sometimes that's why people rise up and do jungle justice, you know, mob justice, you know. So it's, it's a very dicey thing, but I cannot necessarily speak to that because I've never been to a training camp, okay. but I do know that it is um, extremely important that as people are being conditioned to use force, they're also, their minds are also being conditioned to be able to discern when to use it and when not to use it. When they feel that there is a possible threat. And especially now, I think people need to realize that this is a new generation. This is a generation that doesn't have to wait to hear something on radio or watch anything on TV or read the newspaper. Things are happening in real time and being reported on social media. And social media has provided a platform for people to express themselves. You know, freedom of speech. That is what it has done. Everybody now is a reporter. You know, being a journalist is not as fashionable as it used to be. Actually, Citizen journalism. You know what I mean? Yeah, everybody right now is a reporter. And I think um, the state needs to recognize that. But you know what? This is a new generation. This is a new era. And it's not just the youth. All of us are using it for one thing or the other. How do we harness this? How do we use this to our advantage? Because obviously you're aware of the social media bill. Yes. yes. That seems to have uh, resurrected from where it was before. Because we thought it was in comatose, but now it's back. You know, and probably in response to what happened. You know, but that's not going to solve anything. Because... If I were part of government, I would be happy to see people talking there. At least they're talking there and not shooting each other on the streets. You know what I mean? At least if they're talking, I'm able to feel the pulse, even if it's just a section of society. Because, you know, when you talk about people, we're, we're different. In the River Ryan areas in the Niger Delta, people don't have access to internet. So you're not going to find them on Twitter or on Facebook. A lot of places where people don't, there's no network coverage, you know. But at the end of the day, if I were government, I would, I would want to see, I want to hear what people are saying not be taken unaware. Which has been my defense. Because, exactly, started. because if you do but, that, people will go underground. And you're gonna to have to use a lot more resources to find out what's going on. Get that. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And we know in the Niger Delta, when people stop talking and being on the streets, you know that something is simmering under there. I'm going to read the definition of, um, we, we talked about a legitimate uh, monopoly on the use of, um, of force. Of force. Um, it's not. It's not like it's not a legitimate monopoly on the um, violence. However, there's a definition that may be interesting, close to our topic, from the United States Institute of Peace. Legitimate state monopoly over the means of violence is a condition in which a state's security forces operate lawfully under legitimate civilian authority where actors conduct themselves in accordance with democratic norms and principles of good governance. Yeah. Good governance yes. and bad governance. Mm -hmm. This condition <laughs> exists when armed groups from the conflict are disarmed, demobilized, and reintegrated into society. And a military and police force is vetted, retrained, and monitored on human rights Principle. This doesn't run very far away from the hashtags that trended. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And police brutality yep. and bad governance. Mm -hmm. Reform the Nigerian police force. Mm -hmm. People went, I mean, they went into the books, brought out salary schedules of police officers and said, why are these guys paid this little? Mm -hmm. People tried to say, we're not here, we're not against the police, mm -hmm. we're against police brutality. Exactly. Because we also have family members who are in the military who are in the police. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some really good policemen and, and women, and there's some really, really good um, soldiers, female and male. Really, really good people, you know. But at the end of the day, when things, like I said, have been left to simmer, 
it almost becomes like a culture. The entire institution is painted that way, and whereas it may be not. So it's a question of leadership as well. Who's being held accountable for all the police brutality that has been going on? Is it just those who committed those acts? What about those who were, who were supposed to provide oversight? What happened? I, I don't have hmm. the answer. Yeah, I mean, accountability is basically what accountability is missing. Come out to ask exactly. for. Yeah. People tell us what about it. Yes, um, but at the end of the day, it's not just those who committed the acts. Who provided oversight? Why was this allowed to go on for so long? You know, so leadership, everything rises and falls on leadership. In reference to your TED Talk 2018, and um, what you said about um, desensitization of violence. We, are, we seem like we've become numb. Of children to Of violence. children, mm -hmm. in particular, mm -hmm. to violence. I want to ask you the question you asked us. Oh, I'm how can ask we, it again. How can we explore the pathways to which children are desensitized, desensitized to violence? So that one is a new deal. You know, unfortunately, I think I might have to get a little bit academic here, you know, and which means that we actually need to probe, we need to do research. You see, uh, great nations, create policies based on evidence. You know, they're not basically policies that created at a whim. They're based on evidence. And how how is that evidence generated? What kind of voices are being included? I'll give you an example. I know that up in the Northeast, you've had different studies, you know, showing how the pathways through which children are being recruited into the Boko Haram um, terrorist group, right? Down here in the Niger Delta, we have a proliferation of call groups. And from what I've also um, known is that some children have been being recruited from schools, you know, so this is starting really early, you know, but who is actually trying to amplify this using empirical data, you know, mm. because it is based on that data that you are able to, as a policy maker, um, make policies or think about laws. I know there's an anti-cultism law within the State House of Assembly, okay. you know, uh, which talks about, uh, which stipulates the number of years a person who's been involved in cultism will stay in prison. However, when you're talking about children, that's another story. You're not going to detain children, right? Children are always uh, deemed as victims and never really the perpetrators, right. you know? So how do you deal with that? You know, how, how do you conduct that research? Who conducts it and for what purpose? And this is where society organizations need to come in, you know? Because if we're having children uh, being recruited in these groups, it means that you're going to have another generation, you know, which is what the terrorist groups do. You know, that's why they keep recruiting these children. And that is why in Daesh, you know, in the Middle East, Iraq and Syria, we're getting all these brides from the different Western countries because their idea was, oh, we're going to have, uh, we're trying to establish a caliphate here, but when we're gone, we know that our children will take over, you know, thinking long-term. And I think for us, you know, as a people, uh, not just the government, but as civil society, as media, and also others, you know, the ability to think long-term and to anticipate is so, so important, you know, because that is how you actually give uh, seriousness to certain issues now, as opposed to waiting for them to escalate, escalate and think about what could have been done then. Because I'm telling you, before you know it, this can easily escalate into a crisis. It's just a question of, we don't have jobs, uh, Asu is always on strike. You know what I mean? I mean, it's always something or the other. It's a problem. And let's not forget, this is a totally new generation. You know, back in our day, you would do your luta continua and, you know, everybody goes home and sleeps and that's it. But now it's people like enough is enough. And let's not forget, it's not just local, it's becoming global. It is global. Yes, it is global. You know, so, yeah. It's, it's global, as they say. <laughs> global. <laughs> global, global. Yeah. I want to ask you a question, something you said. Um, unemployment, poverty, hand in hand. It's not, I mean, directly proportional to criminality, is it? Not really. Actually, you know, there are people who've often argued that, you know, unemployment is not necessarily a root cause, you know, of conflict, violent conflict. It could be an enabler, but it's not necessarily a root cause because, I mean, truthfully speaking, there are places where Unemployment is high, but people are not taking up arms. So normally it is, um, uh, what should I say? It, it is the multiplicity of factors. Violent conflicts are never uh, unidimensional. They're always multidimensional. So a person might say, because I don't have a job, I am going to take up a gun. 
or I'm going to join this group. But if you dig further, you will find that there are also other issues, you know, except this one might be prominent, but there might be other issues. So I think we have to be careful about the assumptions that we make, you know, because you say, well, if we give them jobs, they're going to stop doing what they're doing. But I'm going to give you an example. You know, somebody kidnaps somebody else, right? And then they ask for one million naira ransom, okay? And then you're like, you know what? You better stop getting involved in crime. We're giving you a job, okay? What am I going to be doing? I'm going to be welding, okay? How much am I going to be making? I'm going to be, you're going to be making this amount, which obviously is not going to be a million, you know? So I think for me, it goes just beyond just having jobs, but also looking at reorientation, you know? And that's where rehabilitation has to come in. You know, mm. so it's not enough to do, let's do skills and acquisition program. When clearly these people have been accustomed to a certain jobs. lifestyle. They've been accustomed to a certain lifestyle. So there has to be, uh, we have to be extremely creative with our programs and try to go through some level of reorientation, which actually takes time. Because some it's people yes. may never change. That is the truth. Some mm. people do not change. If you have studied some, uh, some of these programs, even globally, um, you can see that you know, some of them have been very superficial, you know, because you realize that this person is just not interested. They're not interested in changing their lifestyle. You know, so you could give him jobs, you could give him whatever. And being able to discern that, you know, if you're a person who's an expert in conducting those types of programs is extremely important. Otherwise, before you know it, you have a whole bunch of criminals back on the street. You know, like, yeah, I don't want to go into details. Yeah, so I'll stop. True. Yeah. yeah, so I think we've come to the top of the hour. Yeah. Yeah. Establish a few things. Um, just keeping the conversation going, trying to educate and re-educate ourselves on these issues. 